Okay. What comes to mind when you think of 007? Are Martini shaken and not stirred? The cool sci-fi gadgets? The babes? Maybe Daniel Craig's face comes to mind, I don't know. And I'm not gonna judge. What comes to my mind is this. Double O Seven Goldeneye, a film-to-game adaptation, released in 1997 on Nintendo's home console, the glorious N64. The game soared after launch, amassing a huge player base and grossing over $250 million worldwide. This ended up ranking it as the third best-selling Nintendo 64 game ever, only behind certified classics Mario Kart 64 and the glorious, glorious Super Mario 64 games that need to be brought back. Its gameplay, variety, and added multiplayer mode was all the craze back in the day. I feel bad for all the kids out there that will never get to experience sitting in a room together playing all on one TV as everyone accuses each other of screen cheating. Guess what? We were all screen cheating. It was impossible not to. And for anyone who grew up with this game, we all know that one person that refused to play as any other character other than Oddjob. No! No! A character notoriously built to give players an unfair advantage over their opponents due to the guy's short stature. It was just impossible to hit this guy. I'm done! End the fucking game! Since the release of the extremely mediocre 007 GoldenEye Reloaded game starring Daniel Craig's Bond and a cancelled remaster of the N64 Classic in 2008 due to rights issues, it seemed eager fans were never going to get their hands on it again in a mainstream way. Thankfully though, Xbox and Nintendo stepped up to the plate and announced not long before its release last Friday that the game would be coming to their respective online subscription services, Game Pass and Nintendo Online, with the added bonus of a 4K resolution and a stable frame rate of 30fps. <laughs> I couldn't help but boot it up while I was waiting for the Dead Space remake to release at 11am. Yes, 11am. Remember when we got midnight releases? <sighs> Those were the days. Anyway, I sat and I played at this game for a good must have been 3 hours. And it got me thinking, what really made this game so special in its heyday? And should people play it today? Prior to its release all those years ago, press and media attention surrounding it was really less than stellar. No one expected the game to become the phenomenon it amounted to post-launch. It was developed by a small team of 10 people, two of which had never worked on a game before. They aimed to innovate on the current first-person shooter market by creating story-based levels with exploration and multiple objectives, and innovate they did. The game had an undeniable effect on the game industry and took that first step in showing the world what shooters on consoles could look like. A hurdle that Halo would finally overcome in the early 2000s under Microsoft. In fact, Goldeneye had such a wide-reaching effect that the president of Metro Goldwyn Mayer, the distribution company for the Bond films at the time, announced that the game had a direct impact on Pierce Bronston's films bolstering their success and widening the franchise's appeal as a whole. It played a part in making the franchise as popular as it is today. The story followed the film of the same name with Bond on some cheesy over-the-top secret mission to stop a dangerous weaponized satellite from being used against the Earth. It's filled with good action, cool gadgets that are staples of the deadly agent, and of course, randy women. I'm throwing up. You're making me throw up. Pierce Bronson kills it as James Bond, that's undeniable, though I personally much prefer the angle of Daniel Craig's Bond and his story. At the time of the game's release, the film had already been out for two years, so the story for fans wasn't anything new. It did an okay job of conveying the story in its gameplay, but it really wasn't as engaging as its competitors around the same time. Popular titles like Duke Nukem and Star Fox 64 had voice acting, while Goldeneye didn't, making these long moments of conversation with subtitles just really bland. When you hear people talk about this game, no one ever brings up the story and that's because what made it so special was its gameplay.
Now there were a lot of other shooters on the market already, most notably Quake, but Quake wasn't ported to a console until the end of 1997. Most shooters at the time were arena-based shooters instead of story-driven levels that required exploration and completion of objectives to progress. Each of the 18 levels in GoldenEye had a purpose other than killing waves of bad guys. Some would task the player with freeing hostages, others would insert you into a stealth mission to take pictures of covert hardware. The game didn't hold your hand during these missions either. If you missed an objective and exited the level, players would be met with a failed screen prompting them to play the mission again. Games have undoubtedly come a long way since the late 90s, but not all the changes have been met with praise. Games of today have become increasingly more handholdy. Instead of letting the player naturally figure the game and its obstacles out for themselves. The recent God of War games come to mind. Don't get me wrong, the games are incredible, I love them. But why can't I look at a puzzle for more than 10 seconds without being prompted by dialogue telling me what to do? Why can't I figure that out for myself, even if it takes me longer than the average person? In fact, why include the puzzle in the game at all if you don't allow the players to figure it out for themselves? I guess it's a good way to pad out the game's length, but still. I know I'm not the only one who feels this way, proven by how many people have complained about it over the years. On top of its missions and objective variety, 007 was the first game to have multiple hitboxes on enemies, allowing them to react in a more realistic way. Shooting a guy in the foot has them put their body weight on the uninjured leg. Shooting them in the shoulder makes them grab at the area of pain. It helped the gunplay feel more grounded with visual feedback in both the enemy's reactions and the wide arsenal of guns. The game as a whole took a more realistic approach, even if how enemies react in their over-the-top 80s action-style death animations are the furthest thing from realistic in today's standards. Back then, it was remarkable. Pointing out too that some games today don't even have this level of attention to detail. Assets could also be destroyed in the environment with stray bullets that could affect their surroundings by killing enemies or even hurting the player if they were too close. The AI was certainly more intricate than games had seen before. They would patrol and react to the player in different ways. Foes would display different movements during engagements like side jumping out of the way, rolling to get into cover, or ducking. Sometimes it's hard not to laugh at these animations though. Pair them with those really low poly faces and it's just comedy gold. What is that? I wish I could say the friendly AI was on par, but it just falls short. Hostages will run right into gunfire. Why are you running? Why are you running? And escort missions feel like you're escorting a blind person without being able to talk or touch them to nudge them in the right direction. Despite these minor gripes, the gameplay kept people coming back. Thankfully, players had a lot to return to in the form of these 18 missions because each level was equipped with multiple different difficulties that would add more objectives and increase the damage output, reaction times, and even increase enemy presence. With three difficulty modes and a secret fourth being unlocked once completing all 18 stages on the highest option, players had a lot of content on offer, especially for the time. I haven't even brought up the multiplayer component yet, an addition that arguably made it as big as it was. Other multiplayer games of that era were mostly based around some form of connection to play on different systems together like a PC. Multiplayer to consoles was new, and because the N64 launched with four controller ports, Rare thought it would be a good idea to include a fully fleshed out multiplayer mode capable of up to four player couch split screen. And they thought right, it was a great idea. There were a variety of modes that shipped with the game, some original like Man with a Golden Gun, a mode that would place a golden gun capable of one-shotting everyone on the map, and other standard modes like Team Deathmatch. It was heavily customizable, allowing the players to alter settings like choosing characters, what guns are found in each match, and what map to play on. Rare's title took a realism approach in terms of its presentation. Every setting and every character model is based in reality. This kind of had to be the case because it was based off a film, so their artistic vision for what the game could look like was severely limited. It offers a lot of bleak colors with a lot of grays and browns. When you compare it to games that released the same year, I'd say it holds up. Sure, some games had a little more detail in their assets like Turok, but Rare pushed the N64 to its limits. 
3D gaming was not yet fully made popularized, and as such, it required a lot of power. I just actually realized that I've gotten this far into the video and I haven't even touched on one of the best parts of the game, the soundtrack. A facet that was universally praised when it released all the way up until now. You can't listen to the main theme of this game and tell me that it doesn't slap harder than Will Smith at the Oscars. Yes, I'm still using that joke because I find it incredibly funny. There really aren't many games that have me actively pausing mid-gameplay to hear the epic music. Each mission has its own track as well that gives off the Cold War espionage vibes. Some are more bombastic with heavy drums, and others are more subtle for covert missions. This is just my personal opinion, but it's definitely up there for some of the best music intertwined with this franchise. Look, some people still question why GoldenEye for the N64 found such success. But when you look at its innovations and unique elements for games of that time, especially on consoles, it's really easy to see why even in today's current market, people look fondly upon it, myself included. If you have major nostalgia for a game, it's a no-brainer to go play it again if you have an Xbox or a Switch. If you do have them, then you probably already have played it. Even for the newer generations of gamers, go play this and see what games used to be like. It'll make you appreciate how far games have come, and you may even find a challenge here. Should you play it today? Hell yes you should. I think it says a lot that a game from 1997 is still enjoyable today. That's going to wrap up this video on 007 GoldenEye. Thank you all for watching. If you like the content, please be sure to like, comment, subscribe. Peace out.